morning, good morning, good morning. Here it is, another weekend. I hope you're having a, a good time. Getting ready for something really good. Um, I hope that the COVID is not getting you down. Uh, let's hope it's over soon. So let's get into this today. I wanted to take a look at um, the weasel. I mean, I mean, I mean, the professor Kyle Adams. Um, I'm not sure if he dropped the professor, uh, but he's still uh, looking at stuff and making ridiculous claims so I took his latest video which is um, he's looking at part of the book called modern earth science uh, by Ramsey uh, and he has all of this uh, uh, questions and he says uh, he's confused so I thought we'd look at it a little bit and see if he has any if there is any doubt about the things that he's looking at so here we go I recently had a conversation with an anti-flat earther by the name of Bob the science guy wherein he asked me where the educational system had failed me my answer is in this book right here this book has failed me miserably. So he's told, uh, go read a book, go watch a video, learn something about what you're doing. So instead, he goes back to the book that confused him so he can make some points about why he's confused. Uh, he might have watched a video. Of course, it would have been a flat earth video on YouTube, right? Bob also encouraged me to go read a book or watch a video about astronomy. Thank you for the encouragement, Bob. That is exactly what we are doing today. As many can attest, when you join the censored Earth community, you are given a new set of eyes. Okay, now you guys, try not to laugh too hard at this. He's talking about this book and how it's got them all confused. Well, I went to the publisher and looked up the book. What I found is that the book is aimed at ninth grade. So ninth grade is about 14. Uh, so 14 year olds at school. Uh, and it says uh, its audience is elementary school through high school so like i said in the last video this book is a high school book and it's not to be treated as a general geology book it's strictly an intro for high school level students now I've studied earth science before. Okay, so here he goes with these flat earth eyes again. If only we could get these new eyes. Oh. But now that I've been given a new set of eyes, I'm gonna go back and take another look and tell you what I see. This. Is modern earth science destroyed? Birth of a theory. The Big Bang. Scientific methods are useful tools for the study of earth science. However, the development and testing of a hypothesis is just one step along the way to scientific understanding. So this part they're talking about the scientific method, hypothesis testing, this is just a big joke. I can't tell you how often 
I hear these flat earthers throwing around these terms like they think they know what they're doing. Well, they don't. Uh, I have never once seen a flat earth person explain the scientific method in the proper way that it's supposed to be and use it the way it's supposed to be used. Nor have I seen anyone talk about hypothesis testing and what a hypothesis is, uh, the independent, dependent variables. Um, you just you just can't find a flat earther that knows the first thing about the very basics of science. Once a hypothesis has been tested and generally accepted, it may lead to the development of a theory. A theory is a hypothesis or a set of hypotheses that is supported by the results of experimentation and observation. A theory provides a general explanation for scientific observations that is consistent with known facts. Okay, so here they're talking about uh, hypothesis testing um, and then becoming a theory. Um, I don't think this means it's going to become a theory right immediately. There has to be more uh, testing done. And flat earthers always think theory means the same thing that it means uh, in everyday world, um, talking about, uh, oh, that's just a theory. Um, we don't know for sure, so we'll call it a theory. That's not what a scientific theory is. A scientific theory has been thoroughly tested and is it's called a theory because they know that it's got truth to it know what it is okay after that you go along and it, after it's been used and proven true in different cases um, and tested more uh, it can be used in the real world uh, can be used for uh, predicting things then it becomes a scientific law but being a law takes a lot of effort and a lot of testing. Once a theory is well established through research and experimentation, it may become a scientific law. A scientific law is a rule that correctly describes a natural phenomenon. To become a law, a theory must be proven correct every time it is tested. For example, the law of conservation of mass and energy, which states that the total amount of matter and energy in the universe does not change, has been tested again and again. It has never been found to fail. The total amount of mass and energy in the universe doesn't change? Oh boy. Here he's just shocked. Conservation of mass and energy. And then he says, how do scientists know how much mass is in the universe? You just think they just measured the whole universe. Well, uh, that's a fallacy. Uh, they don't have to measure the whole universe. They've measured what they can see. They take an, an average. Um, they can see the density, how, how spread out, what they can see is. They know the size of the universe. So they, t they uh, can tell how much mass is in the universe and it's strictly a, a scientific uh, it's strictly a measurement or a average strictly an average and it is not, you know, they haven't gone out um, with some kind of measuring tool and measured the whole universe. Um, and energy the same way. They can measure energy in certain spots. Uh, they have an idea how much energy is in the 
different areas that they're watching and observing so they can go from there and find an average find a, a met you know a method of finding um, how much there is in the whole universe by you know their by the fact that they know how big the universe is so it, it's not hard and it's not um, it's not anything that can't be done I you know I'm just amazed at the shock value uh, that he says about the um, about this uh, massive energy conservation um, if you remember uh, Einstein's theories uh, he has the famous equation that we all know by heart E equals MC squared uh, C is the constant speed of light it never changes it's a constant so E is proportional to M E and M uh, can transfer between each other uh, so um, you know we can make uh, energy out of mass we can make mass out of energy uh, so that's that's the true story there they speak as though they knew exactly how much energy and mass was in the entire universe as if someone had gone out and explored it all oh my goodness shock what all the incredula incredulity Oh, the incredulity, the shock. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. Okay, for some reason now, suddenly we're talking about the moon. It's not in the book, but you know we'll go on this book makes it sound like they went a lot farther than the moon they must have destroyed a lot of technology there yes lost the ability to go back to the moon however let me try to explain this so that you can understand in the 70s or in the 60s 70s uh, nasa had about four percent of the federal budget it's not much I mean as far as percentages go but you know it was a good amount in the 70s Congress decided that we didn't need to go back to the moon uh, and this was a decision by Congress Congress controls NASA's budget so Congress decided we don't need to go back to the moon. We've learned everything that we can learn about that. And so um, there's no reason to go back to the moon. NASA's budget was cut from 4% to 0.4%. Now you tell me, you tell me, if you got a 90% cut in pay, how would you feel about that? How much work could you get done on 90% less than you had before? That's exactly what NASA had. Um, they had, they still, with the cutting budget, they still had 10 major facilities to run. They still had, you know, roughly 20,000 employees. Congress made another edict that uh, NASA had to include contract people uh, to do some of the work. So now they had 60,000 contractors on uh, employed. Uh, but in all of this, uh, once they cut the moon landing, 
on the moon trips, um, they had facilities that they didn't need anymore because they didn't need the Saturn V rocket, they didn't need the moon lander, uh, they didn't need that development. So there are facilities that were completely shut down. Uh, maybe they were used for something else. They had uh, uh, engineers that had to work, they had to make money. So a lot of them left NASA and went somewhere else where they could work. Um, so yes, they lost a lot of the technology and the ability to, um, to go back to the moon. It was lost. Nobody denies that. Uh, but it wasn't just because like a lost shoe, you know, you didn't just go around and look and find, oh, there it is. Uh, it was serious. There wasn't enough money. Uh, NASA began doing unmanned uh, spacecraft. And yes, they've, just, they've studied the solar system. They've sent uh, satellites to, uh, you know, the moons of Jupiter. Uh, the moons of Saturn, uh, Neptune, they sent Voyager 1, Voyager 2 out past the solar system. Uh, they have a, uh, they have one that's studying the sun right now. Uh, so there's been a lot of work done, but it's all unmanned. They can't send a man to, uh, uh, to these places because it's pro prohibitively expensive. Much cheaper to send uh, unmanned craft. How can they claim to know the total amount of mass and energy in the entire universe if we don't even know how much mass and energy is at the bottom of our own ocean? Guess what I found. You'll never guess. He says, uh, we haven't even found the mass or the energy of the oceans, much less the mass and energy of, the, of outer space. Well, I looked it up. It's so easy these days, you know, to Google something. You can look it up in just a, half a minute. So I looked this up. The mass of all the oceans combined is 1.37 times 10 to the 21st kilograms. So 1.37 times 10 to the 21st kilograms. That's the mass of the oceans. The energy in the oceans or from the oceans, uh, 94 uh, terawatts, terawatt hours per year. 94 terawatt hours per year. So surprise, surprise. Yeah, it seems they didn't count all the mass and energy and all those new fish people are continually finding, let alone all the new stars people are continually discovering. Well, that was my silly dog adding you per uh, disagreement for that. Fish and the stars. Well, goodness, the um, can't possibly know the mass of the oceans because there are fish down there. Those, you know, those little fish that weigh about a, a kilogram or you know maybe hundred grams or something. Uh, sure makes a big difference on the uh, mass of the ocean, right? And then we have these stars. They say, oh, these stars are being created every minute. These uh, astronomers are finding these new stars that are being created. Well, yes, some of them are new. Um, we've seen stars that are created. Uh, if you remember mass 
Oh, e, e equals mc squared. Uh, so, um, yes, some of them are new. But guess what? A lot of these new stars that uh, Kyle and his wife are so shocked about are newly discovered stars. So yes, it's new to the astronomers, but that doesn't mean that they were newly created. Uh, that just means that we've got a telescope big enough, uh, maybe the Hubble, where we can look out farther and see new stars that we haven't seen before. Sheesh. In the late 19th century, research revealed that when chemical elements are heated, they too produce spectra. An element is a substance that has a characteristic set of physical and chemical properties. Instead of a full spectrum of continuous colors like that produced by sunlight, a heated element produces only a series of thin colored lines spaced at uneven intervals. This series of colored lines called a bright line spectrum indicates that the light source is sending out only certain wavelengths of light. Each element produced its own bright line spectrum, as unique as a set of fingerprints. So here they are showing us different color patterns that these elements produce. I just really wish the book explained what each of those numbers at the bottom of the illustration represent. My best guess on the matter is that they are just showing us the range of the color spectrum. If each color were to be assigned a number, that would be it. Let's continue though. Okay, so here they start talking about spectra, spectral analysis, and they're just incredulous that, you know, something like this could work. Uh, trust me, this spectral analysis was done in the laboratory under strict conditions, time after time after time. Uh, I did spectral analysis when I was in college. So I'm sure a lot of people around the world have done that spectral analysis. Uh, each element, iron, gold, silver, uh, helium, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, they all have their individual uh, spectra. Just like a fingerprint, each one has a separate spectra that can be identified. Uh, so when they look at a star, uh, they can look at it through a certain lens and look at the spectra. They can tell from the spectra what elements are in that star. They know if it's hydrogen or helium. Uh, they see the heavy elements, iron, nickel, um, and those things. So, uh, yes, it can be done. Yes, the spectra are there. Uh, they can look at it and see them. Uh, he showed you that graph in the book. Uh, it's kind of amusing because he says, I wish they would tell us uh, what those numbers at the bottom mean. Well, if you happen to look at those numbers, each number is followed by a capital A with a little circle at the top. That symbol, capital A with the little circle, is a symbol for angstroms. So each one of those numbers is, you know, 5,600 angstroms. Uh, it's telling you how, how much that spectral line is, each one of those. So once you're familiar with that graph, what those spectral lines mean, and now you can tell uh, at what point they are appearing, uh, you have a you have a fingerprint analysis of that element and of that star. So just like in fingerprints in a murder investigation. Uh, now they have the fingerprints of those elements in whatever star they're, they're studying. 
So it's not that hard. Uh, and like what I said before about uh, this book, it was written for ninth graders. So if I was a college graduate, I think I would be embarrassed to be um, so confused by a ninth grader's book. So I can assure you that he's reading too much into it. He's trying to uh, put in words that they didn't put in or things that you did not need to know when you were in ninth grade. Um, so, you know, if he wants to understand deeper about geology, um, he needs to get a book. Um, he needs to get an advanced uh, introduction to geology. Uh, make sure that it's at college level. Um, and he'll learn a little about, you know, different rocks and fossils and minerals, uh, all this stuff. Uh, you know, he may have to get several books because this is really a wide range covered in one book. So I thank you for tuning in this week. I hope you've had a good time and understood what's going on. Uh, so stay tuned for more stuff next week uh, and we'll see you then.